Okay, fantastic. Yep, so uh, myself and Darren are going to um, share with you today our learnings from the design of a Pathways model as part of a technologies appraisal program for NICE uh, that we built in our actually reasonably recently and took up an entire six months of mine and Darren's life. <laughs> um, so why did we want to do this in the first place? <coughs> So NICE had noticed that recommendations and inputs are often inconsistent. Ooh, sorry. Sorry. What's up? Just, just got fire I'm just gonna Ooh. Okay. Like this. Do we need to run? Yeah, we'll wait a minute. And it also gives me an excuse to quickly change oh, I love it. this because I'm not showing the Don't right forget screen. to commit and push. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just hold for a minute while we, we're just waiting for a second to see if this is an actual fire <laughs> alarm. Maybe we have to It's quite quiet for an actual I fire. Wasn't, I wasn't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't informed about yeah. that. <coughs> right. mm. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I was going to say it's to the point where it could be tinnitus rather than a fire. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was doing this. <laughs> All right. Cool. Are we good? <laughs> mm. Who filled the room with carbon monoxide? Yeah. Five minutes, please. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Um, maybe just type something in the chat for them. That is very beepy. Yeah. Now that I've actually noticed it. <laughs> Apologies for the delay, the room has become devoid of oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> Congratulations. Sorry, Dawn. Sorry. That's okay. Thanks, fire safety team. <laughs> Clearly, it just needed somebody to stand next to it and look at it, so we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, are we okay to restart? We good? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So to be fair, that was very like the actual project that we did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of false starts. So in keeping. Um, why did we want to do this whole damn thing in the first place? So um, NICE wanted us to build an independent open source reference model for renal cell carcinoma for the reason that they'd noticed that the recommendations and inputs that have been used in previous technology appraisals have been pretty inconsistent. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to see if having a reference model would help be more consistent in the future. None of the previous appraisals had considered subsequent therapy appropriately, so a lot of them were petition survival models and literally just jammed on some subsequent therapy costs that had nothing to do with the overall survival data in there. And they noticed that treatments had been recommended, which in hindsight were not cost effective, um, for definite. <laughs> yeah. In that there was a previous appraisal before ours, which uh, compared all of the relevant treatments for intermediate poor risk, and found that one of the newer therapies that had already been improved actually wasn't cost effective versus the older treatments. And then we jammed a newer therapy on top of that, uh, saying that it was only for those patients who could get the uh, one that come before. Yeah. So we'd built up recommendations, which we know probably weren't the best for the NHS already, and we wanted to explore that within this Pathways project. And then lastly, the process for NICE and EAGs to, with technology appraisals is, to be fair, pretty inefficient particularly for disease areas where we've got uh, lots and lots of treatments coming through. So process at the moment, manufacturer makes a model, sends it to the EAG to check, we send back a ton of changes, committee has a think about it, makes some more changes, and then next time we come back, guess what, the manufacturer builds an entirely new model, so they say again, <laughs> and none of those learnings get carried through and we're all building the same model over and over, and I remember this from my life in consulting, so we were trying to fix that problem. Uh, what did we build? So um, we had to build our model to support a live appraisal. As probably people realise, this is not ideal for a pilot programme. <laughs> uh, the model we were asked to build is really quite complex. Uh, IVI built an open source model of a similar level of complexity in two years. We had six months to do ours on the live appraisal. So hard. Uh, we had to be able to look at sequences in renal cell carcinoma to support future initiatives that NICE is looking at in terms of making decisions across an entire pathway rather than just individual points. 
Uh, we had to look at petition survival and state transition structures to see what difference the model structure would make. Uh, we had both time varying hazard ratios and time varying hazards, so actually pretty complex. Uh, the data that we got from the intervention company, we had kind of semi-patient level data, we had aggregate data from comparators, we had uh, in semi-patient level data from registry, so there's a lot of different types of data sources that we had to combine together. And NICE wanted us to explore what the impact of using real-world evidence versus trial is for baseline risk. So again, we've got two whole different sets of data going in here. That jammed into 744 possible sequences across our four active lines of treatment, up to 14,000 states per sequence, 2,080 cycles, 40-year time horizon weekly, and three populations. That is a lot of computational power. <laughs> Um, and sadly, no template models to follow of anywhere near this level of comp complexity. So given our complexity and computational requirements, our was the logical choice. We did actually try building one of those patient flows in Excel. Uh, it ran once <laughs> in three minutes. One cycle. <laughs> For three one minutes. cycle. <laughs> so yeah, definitely <laughs> are required here. Or software, good software required here. <laughs> so how did our model actually work? So sadly you can't get away from Excel entirely because we are wed to this in the HDA process. So our model inputs were loaded from an Excel front end to allow the company and other stakeholders to better be able to interact with at least the inputs. Um, and we also fed in our, our outputs from our stats files, so things like survival analysis, the animate, etc. We then produced a list of possible sequences based upon the rules we defined for what could follow uh, what in each of the different populations. We extrapolated our effectiveness for the reference treatments per line with the real-world evidence in our base case. We then calculated our comparator efficacy, efficacy per line, and Darren's going to show you how this actually works because it's pretty cool. Uh, we adjust for treatment effect waning, general population mortality, curves crossing, and then use that to produce our final health state occupancy. To this, we apply our costs and benefits, again coming from the Excel file, generate our results per sequence, weight our sequence results to generate our results according to what the selected first line treatment is, because that's a decision problem we had for our appraisal. But of course you could just look at net benefit across sequences if you want to. And lastly we implemented automated results output to Word, which to be fair was damn helpful, because in this appraisal we had at the end something like 80 odd scenarios that we had to run, uh, that the NICE committee wanted us to look at. And if we hadn't automated that, it would have been impossible. <laughs> so. Darren's going to run through two of our cool functions. Oh no. Um, okay, so uh, we, we, had a, we had a massive problem. I'm about to show you four slides. I've only got five minutes and they're all really complicated, so I'm just going to whiz through it and you can <laughs> read them after because I think that's a bit better. Um, so uh, we had a massive challenge because we had sporadic pieces <laughs> of information spread across different populations, lines, molecules, trials, and endpoints. So we made an abbreviation PLMTE for one bit of data. So we, we had a load of those. They're all sporadically all over the place in different populations, lines, molecules, trials, and endpoints. And we don't know ex ante in the code uh, how they link to each other. So we need a generalized way of linking anything to anything across any degree of separation in any line, in any population, mm. in any treatment. So uh, <laughs> a little bit of thought had to go into it. So. Uh, Everything came from patient data or Excel file and fed into a giant great big list, basically. And the list is nested on the population level, then the trial level, uh, population, line, molecule, trial, endpoint level. So each E is very specific. Inside of E was an identifier of that PLMTE, so you could use it as a reference, and uh, another element for origin. So where is it supposed to come from? Mm. So we've got... Uh, if the origin is the same as the destination, then it's a reference line. If the, orig if the origin doesn't exist, then we don't need to populate that E. If it's different, then it needs relative efficacy to populate it. So now we've got a completely universal system for putting things in places <laughs> and linking them together. The problem is how do you then do that? So uh, it, <laughs> it, it ended up a recursive recursive function, so a re nested recursive function um, on the top there, the top little bit in the first degree of separation, <coughs> or zero degrees of separation, essentially works down a table and puts the reference curves in the right places in the list. 
Then it goes round again and goes to a, that, that bit at the bottom. Second table works its way down a table that looks at each destination, then looks at the origin, asks, is there something inside that origin or not yet? And if there is something inside the origin, and we have a relative efficacy in this destination, that times that, or that to the power of that, or that relative efficacy applied there, now that populates mm. that destination for the next time around. So that's one degree of, if, as it works its way down all of the destinations, that's one degree of separation expanded. So as it goes down, it, it propagates the network in any way with assumptions, stopping rule, anything. So in a, in a kind of universal way, it just kind of folds out the tree of, of, of all of the different NMAs and et cetera that you have to give you an even bigger list <laughs> with <laughs> loads of survival extrapolations in it. Um, now, you've got that, but you still need to make 744 Markov traces with different lines of <laughs> numbers of lines of therapy and structural assumptions in them. How do you do that? So, um, you work down each uh, treatment sequence that you have and compile a, a, a quite an interesting matrix. The matrix can be massive. <laughs> it can be that times that big. Um, essentially, uh, there's a, there's a Funny bit of maths, uh, you can do a tunnel state in, in maths by taking a diagonal matrix and moving it across by one. So then it's impossible to stay in the same state, have to move along by one. And then taking those and putting them in blocks in a matrix. And then sticking on death and putting a one in the bottom right is a giant transition probability matrix for an unlimited amount of tunnels, basically. So it theoretically could go to infinity but it's kind of uh, explosively sized, so it becomes really big. The, pro the other problem is, um, most of it's zeros. <laughs> so about 85% of it's made out of zeros. So we switched to using a package called Matrix with a capital M, and lo and behold, it becomes about a thousand times more efficient to, to multiply. Mm -hmm. And the, the keen-eyed amongst you might see that there's a, a little, uh, clever little R trick that goes back to the S days before mm -hmm. R, um, because uh, little known fact, if you change a number inside a matrix in R, it actually copy pastes the entire matrix, puts it somewhere else in the RAM, and changes the reference. And this replaces it in place. So um, that one line sped up the model by about 90% or something. <laughs> it's bizarre. Uh, so that's how you go from sporadic pieces of information and <coughs> assumptions in an Excel file to 744 traces for different treatment pathways. This has been my TED talk, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, uh, some of our lens, and is it everything it could be? No, obviously, built in six months in a heat of a technology appraisal. Um, <laughs> things that we learn are accessibility. So we supplied our code with some video explanation, written instruction, <coughs> and had many calls to walk through the manufacturers. They still really struggled with engaging with a model that was partly in our. Um, we had originally been told that a shiny front end could be put on as a second stage of our project. Unfortunately, this didn't end up being funded. I think that really would have helped because the people who were trying to engage, actually, they weren't Excel coders. It was the uh, main manager at the client side, and he just wanted to be able to tinker with some inputs. Um, and the Excel was huge. Yeah, and the Excel was huge. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that would massively have helped us. Um, we also struggled, being completely frank, with the version control and get. That takes a lot longer to learn than I had anticipated. Yeah. <laughs> so give yourself time if you want to try and do that, and you do need to do it if you've got a big team working on a model like this. So transparency-wise, there's way more detail in this model than you would usually get for an STA model. Lots and lots of data sources, and we try to be as transparent as possible. This means presenting all your intermediate calculations. Um, and in our case, generating everything directly from the code to eliminate the chance of having copy-paste errors, etc. Unfortunately, uh, things that we weren't able to do in the time frame was provide full documentation for all of our functions, but generally we did try to be as good as possible with the comments, although obviously we'd recommend documentation if possible. Uh, QC-wise, um, <coughs> Rob at DSU did our QC and found no major errors, <laughs> but which me and Darren are amazingly grateful. Um, unfortunately, no unit testing in place for the majority of functions, again, time frames, so would be recommended in future. <coughs> Flexibility-wise, obviously you've seen that's a hell of a lot of flexibility already, 
but there is loads of other functions in an oncology model that you maybe want to make it able to handle all of the decision problems flexible survival analysis maybe different utility resource <coughs> application etc ability to use tpps mm. so you've got here a reasonably good starting template for most oncology but not quite that yet Sadly, no resources in place to maintain this model yet, but we'll have a chat about that in a minute. <laughs> and uh, no resource in place yet to update. Uh, in terms of future appraisals, I've spoken to one of the manufacturers coming after us, and they were already discussing how they might use this best in their appraisal. So I am hoping it's going to get future use, despite the lack of maintenance. Last slide for me. Where next? So. This is the controversial Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is mine and Darren's controversial idea. So if we are using R genuinely within HTA, we want it to be available for future use, right? So how do we do that and how do we make sure everybody's got that access uh, in as um, logical and easy to use way as possible? So our thought was something like this, HEverse. So forking package structure with resource packages available for manufacturers and EAGs who are coming next to build the next model. So each individual model could be rolled into its own package taking resources from previous models that it's used during construction. You could imagine having a meta package, in our case called NICE, so something with all your resources, common functions that everybody's going to use, like how do we apply general population mortality? There's one good way to do that, we've got a function, we know it works. <laughs> uh, templates containing things like layouts, reports, etc. so everything's getting generated in the right way. Um, and then for each TA, we keep a record of it. And we could keep a record of it at different stages like we did on our project. So here's your initial model, here's the one post-factual accuracy check, here's the one after technical engagement, etc. So we've got a good log of exactly what's changing along the line, which is not something you get in Excel, which is a pain. <laughs> and next step to get there, uh, we're putting in at the moment a joint application for grant funding with Bristol, Sheffield, York and UCL. Um, and part of our, our work package is to create a template for gold standard model implementations for people to piggyback off in a set area of key disease areas, oncology being an obvious one, seen as currently what manufacturers do is essentially resubmit the same model over and over for 90% of cases. <laughs> this is your opportunity to get involved. If you find that of interest, come and talk to me at one of the breaks. Um, yep, yeah, okay, that's me done. Any questions? <laughs> <coughs> Don and Darren. Sorry, we went over a bit. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. You're absolutely fine. Um, any questions? Don't go away. <laughs> <You're still here. laughs> any questions for Don? Hide in the corner. Darren. <laughs> for Darren. <laughs> Howard. And so, thanks for a really fantastic piece of work. And I said something that we we spend a lot of time on, but we don't talk about a lot is deciding data structures historically. Mm. So seeing that nested mm. is within this, uh, I use that often, and yeah. wonder is that the best way? And then the massive needs to be a matrix. Uh, and then the RAM trick is really cool to see why that works. Yeah. I have used it, but I didn't realize that was why it was so yeah, it's very weird. There's a help file somewhere on the website, in, at the R website, that explains hmm. how it, the, the mechanics, and it's hidden like, you know, down a really long HTML page somewhere. Yeah. Of, of this is this thing, and it puts it in a thing called hmm. star temp star, uh, and puts it in a different memory space. Yeah, I had to Google how do I make this happen faster, <laughs> basically? <laughs> well, lot, yeah, because version one of our state transition model took about two hours to run on Darren's computer, and that version takes 10 minutes, which is now feasible for a HTA. Two hours isn't. <laughs> a decent PC. Yeah. On, on his good PC. Yeah, yeah. On my uh, not-so-great laptop, about an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. It's, mm. it's very RAM-hungry, this model. It's about 14 mm. gig of RAM, somewhere. Just like one that. obvious question, you're using 14,000 states because you're using kernel states? Yeah, e count in each. I may not have fully understood, is that because you're using a discrete time markup model? Yeah. So you could have moved to a continuous time individual and then... We could have, done a, we could have done a DAS. Absolutely, mm. we could have done a DAS. Yeah. We think that, well, we discussed this with... Not necessarily a DAS, a state transition or, like this emotion would work. Yeah, well. okay. Anything like that, yeah. Mm. I mean, we discussed this with NICE at the beginning of the project. Mm. And essentially the consensus was that if we tried to go even further away from the model structures that they normally see, the chances of the appraisal falling over and ending in an appeal were too high for that to be worth the risk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here we have the compromise. Mm. <clears throat> uh, any, sorry, go on. Mm. So, uh, I, I know this is an R meeting, but these problems mm. you have because you use an R, do you 
did it in <laughs> C or something, which is the basically <laughs> you were trying to emulate it physically in <laughs> C, right? So it, maybe you should have, like, you could call C RTTT or something like that, and you would have <laughs> avoided these sort of hacky things. That's there. precisely what the matrix package does. Yeah, I know, but you're basically <laughs> going through someone else's package to do that. You could just write your C code and call it. I think. I think our industry is not in a place to do that mm -hmm. because well, you would just you immediately be called a black box and dismissed. Yeah, well, uh, this is probably black boxy anyway, isn't it? Uh, because of your template could make it work. So there's always guess. a degree mm. of mm. something hidden from the user. They always mm. like having a shiny app all the way down to maybe write it in C. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. actually so a reason that I don't like putting cost-effectiveness models in our packages because it obfuscates mm. the code. Yeah. Uh, so we we didn't do that. It's not a package. Mm. It's just code. Yeah, that's an interesting mm. one, maybe for future thought. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> you know. it, there are yeah. there are loads of optimizations I think in this in this code that could be done. Yeah. Like the the big PLMT mm. e list could be an R six, yeah. uh, object orientated. It would have been way faster to do that, but yeah. I, I'm not very good at doing that, so I didn't do it. Well, right. essentially, <laughs> you've, you've got what people can manage in six months with yeah, the skills yeah, available. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if you can see potential yeah. for optimization, then that's, that's <coughs> a potential contribution to the yeah, project going forward, you. I think. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Just to tack on to that one, specific packages would be very good for mm. such things as things like scale attack, hello attack, mm. and other uh, last libraries, basically, mm. uh, algebra type of things like these. Yeah. So when you're doing things in C, Someone has almost always already done it, and for C libraries that actually written in mm. Fortran, they're faster again. Mm. Um, that's tends to be what what I used to do. Um, we used to always try and use as last libraries as possible. So yeah, pick that mm. one. I think one. I think Matrix might use them. I think, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> it sounds familiar. Yeah, because yeah. when it installs itself, it calls a load of Fortran. So yeah. <laughs> when you can install it from source, that's the only basis that I'm saying that. <laughs> so potentially, again, optimization mm. would be really good for this because it's it's quite a computationally heavy model, particularly for RAM, mm. and uh, it would be it would be quite beneficial mm. to be able to make it more accessible not on a tower PC. Mm. Would it run on a HPC? Yeah, it, it did, did run it on a HPC. HPC. We well, ran the PSA via HPC. And the 100 scenarios that yeah. we had in the end. <laughs> and that way you got results in half a day rather than longer. <laughs> yeah. One on the fire laptop in the corner. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's thank again Doreen and <laughs> for the presentation.